Hello everyone and welcome back to another video with the Adventures of the Memory Makers. I've got a quick question for you. If you own a teardrop like we do, this is a 2022 Bushwhacker 10 HD, have you ever wished that there was some way that you could have a quick simple cover for the galley when the galley lid is open and you're cooking? So let's say you're at camp and it's kind of a drizzly misty day and you're, you're trying to huddle underneath the lid when it's up. So if you're doing that, you know, you've got very little distance here from the edge of the lid and you're in here trying to huddle to stay dry. It would just be nice to have something quick, simple, and effective that would give you a little bit more cover and protection while you're in the, in the galley cooking. So if you're like me, that's just something that you've always wanted. And what I did was, you know, I weighed the pros and cons of all the different options out there from the easy ups that people set up over top of their campers to the awnings that they attach to their camper and they extend back over the galley. You know, and, and I, each one has its pros, each one has its cons. I didn't want to do the, the additional awning because of all the guidelines that go off of it. So what I did was I came up with a, a simple idea, at least I thought it was simple, um, to create my own galley end wall, similar to what the awnings like the ARB and the Ironman have. They have end walls that attach to the outside edge of the camper to extend that and give a little protection. So I looked at those and I thought, you know, that'd be pretty simple to make. So I ordered in some material and started sewing and came up with something that uh, I think turned out pretty slick. So let me show you how easy this is to set up. So if you already have your camper leveled and set up like this one is, you're ready to proceed to the next step. And the one thing that I did um, in order to prevent this lid from coming down from the weight of my end wall back here on the end, once I tension that with the, the uh, stakes in the ground, was I looked and I looked and I finally found the perfect material to do this. What I got was it's 3 8 inch PEX waterline material and I slid it on my table saw and put a groove down it. So what it does is it snaps right around the metal portion of my nitrogen strut. And what that does is it prevents the weight of that or the load of my galley end wall from pulling that down. So I made one for each side. They just snap right on like that. And now I don't have to worry about the galley end wall pulling my lid down. Now I will say there is a little bit of play in the hinge itself, and that's just by the design of the hurricane hinge. So you, you can still get a little bit of deflection in the lid, but it's nothing like it would be if it was compressing those nitrogen struts down. So once I have those snapped in place, I just take my galley end wall that I made, and I'm gonna set my stakes out back here first. about where I think the end wall is going to end. Now it probably helps to be a little bit on the tall side to do this, but what I did was I made my galley end wall so it would just snap to the edge of the galley lid or door. And I used I believe, seven snaps here. So once that's attached, it's attached to the top. I just let it unroll out here in my hands. And now this is kind of an arbitrary thing here. You don't want to put it so tight that it's pulling a lot of pressure on your, your wall. And you want to make it so that there's a gap between the bottom of the end wall and the ground. So it allows air pressure to escape because you don't want this to be turned into a balloon or a, a parachute on you. So we'll just set that for there right now, and then we'll go do the other corner. And I will say for those of you that have seen the other video that we did earlier today on the, uh, the new stabilizer jacks and the, the rear hitch, I do own more than one shirt. It's just, it was such a nice day. We decided to record a couple videos and get some film in the bank for the not so nice days. So now we've got the back of the galley wall stretched out. The sides, all I do here is bring it around. And these you can play with and set wherever you want, depending on what the weather is, what the wind is. You know, if you don't even want to put them out. And one change I think I am going to make is I, I think it will add a couple of extra grommets to the sidewalls so that I have a little bit more flexibility on where I position the stake at. So I'll go ahead and stick 
a short stake in the ground. This is still a kind of a work in progress because I just finished this a couple of days ago. So we'll go with that. We'll swing around to the right side. But you can see here, I can't really get tension on my, my wall with the ground elevation the way it is. So I think if I put another set of grommets in the sides up here at this area, that will take care of that and give me a little bit more options on where to use my tie downs at. <clears throat> it's that simple. So now we've got protection from the elements on the end of the galley. And <clears throat> what we can also do, if you watched any of our previous videos, is we have a video out on how to do galley wing walls. So we can set that up. And this merely Velcros to the camper door and the camper itself down this side. to give us that much more protection. And then because we have a, a camp chef, not a, not a camp, what was I calling it before? Uh, magic oh, chef. Magic chef, that's it. You know, we have a camp chef oven. <laughs> so we've got a galley wing wall designed to go around it. And I remembered, this is how bad I am, my memory today. Um, this works best if I put the, the wing wall up first and then pull the oven out and attach it, then vice versa. So. This goes like this. These wing walls, they're a super simple DIY project, just like the end wall. Um, and we've got a video on that that we'll provide a link to in the description. Um, but they make a great wind block. And even without the end wall, I'll use these wing walls. So there we got that. Then we'll pull our Camp Chef oven out and attach that. So there, in a matter of what, two, three minutes, we now have almost a full enclosure for our teardrop galley. And that's gonna block the wind, it's gonna block the rain, you know, the mist, you know, and the nice thing about it is it actually traps quite a bit of heat in there. So if you don't have these up in cooler weather, you can stay pretty warm back in your galley while you're cooking. Now, again, I didn't run this all the way to the ground because I wanted to allow, you know, if the wind is blowing, you don't want to turn that into a big parachute back here behind your camper. So that gap around the bottom is going to allow that air pressure to, you know, slip out underneath the end wall. Uh, but we got a nice window back here. Did you get the window in the view? I don't know if I did or not. Do you want to set up the table? Yep, I'll grab the table real quick. So let me move this wall back so that you can see in there a little better. And that's the great thing about it is it's very customizable for your, you know, however your setup is. You can pull this back, you know, allow a bigger entry area into it, um, or just get it out of the way for better filming. <laughs> Let's do that. Let's just flip him over there. So you can see we've got room for a table on the inside. We've got, you know, the nice window here letting light in, uh, which is really nice in the daytime when it's brighter out. And then we can turn our lights on inside. And you know, we've got plenty of room to cook. We're protected from the elements. Now, I have had people ask me about the actual galley wing walls and whether they would prevent water from coming in up here in this corner. And one of the big issues that the bushwhacker has is almost all of them leak right here in the corner of your galley hinge. And that hurricane hinge, it's a great design for the hinge itself, but they cut it too short when they built the campers. So what happens is the water comes down your, your lid, gets collected in that hurricane hinge, runs off to the side, and on the factory hinge, it ends right at this opening. So the water just runs right inside. 
Well, people have asked me is if the galley wing wall will prevent that water from running in their galley. The answer is no. It's going to run in somewhere. Even if this diverts it a little bit, it's going to run in down at the bottom. So the fix to that is to extend that hinge, and there are multiple ways to do that. Uh, we did a video early on about how we replaced that lower section of hinge, and that gets the water out so that it runs down this channel, which is designed between these two, between the molding and the rubber, to act as a rain channel to get that water to stay out of your galley. And again, if the wind is really blowing hard, it's not going to prevent it anyway because the wind's going to blow it in your galley. <clears throat> so, but in a light misting rain, you know, something along those lines, this is an awesome setup. Like I said, you got plenty of room for a table in there. So generally it's just me working in the galley. Um, Cindy's on fire detail most of the time. So there is plenty of room in here for me to work. You know, I got my refrigerator, got counter space, got my table for extra space here. So it's, it's just, a, yeah, probably is. Um, it's just a really nice setup. And, you know, we're going to show you here in the next part of the video what you will need to do this yourself and you know essentially how you know a few tips and tricks that i used along the way but it's it's pretty much straight sewing i mean it's all straight seams for the most part it's just a very very big project you know when you get it all put together so you need a big space in order to do this but that said it's very simple very doable and we'll go over and set up and show you you know how we did the window and how we got that top set up there so that you know you can feel very confident in tackling this yourself so for about a hundred bucks in materials you know in an afternoon of your time i think once you watch the second part of this video you'll be able to whip something up like this for yourself and even if you don't have a bushwhacker as long as your door goes up high enough to give you the headroom that you need you know i'm six one so i need some pretty good headroom but you know if you're a shorter individual and you have a smaller teardrop as long as that door goes up high enough to give you headroom underneath you can do something like this in the afternoon and and have some protection for you at your galley so let's go over and uh, show you what you'll need and, and how we we actually did this and we'll pick up from there okay over here in the shop what we're going to do is just do a quick rundown of the materials that i used in order to produce the galley end wall and share a little bit of the where i got those from and, and what it is um, obviously, you know, you're going to be sewing, so you're going to need a sewing machine. Um, and this is a, a Sailrite LSZ-1. Uh, it is a, basically an industrial walking foot sewing machine, but don't think that you need that in order to do this. This material, um, I think there was probably only one spot uh, where it got kind of thick to the point where, you know, I would have had to slow down a little bit with my Kenmore in order to sew this. The average home sewing machine should do this project just fine, um, but you need a big area to do it. And I can't caution you. I can't you know, stress that enough because I built this sewing table for this machine. It's recessed into it, which is really nice because it's level at the top. But in all honesty, it's not big enough. You know, I wish this area was like eight by eight off of this side because the moment that you're sewing along and that top falls off your table, it starts pulling at your top. And then it's a fight, you know, to get it back on. You know, it just takes time. You got to work your way through it. Uh, but the average home sewing machine will do this project just fine. Obviously, you're going to need some material. Uh, this is just a scrap piece that we're going to use for demonstration purposes. Uh, but I'll put a link in the description to what I used. And it comes in a 60-inch wide lit length width. I guess not length, it'd be width. Um, and I ordered in, just for the galley end wall, I ordered six yards. Um, so that gave me my three-yard piece for the, the actual back part. And then it left me a three-yard piece um, for the two sides. And that worked out really well. Now I will caution you this. Uh, if you're going, if you think you want to do both the end wall and the wing walls on the side, get the material for both at the same time. Don't do what I did. I ordered material, you know, back first of the year for the wing walls. Uh, then I ordered what I thought was the same material for the end wall. It came off a different roll of material. It's not the same gray as what the original gray was. So I just caution, you know, no matter where you get it from, whether it be eBay, Sailrite, or Joann's, or any place like that, get it all at the same time and preferably off the same bolt of fabric so that they all match. And I, I know Cindy's standing over there thinking, ooh, gray. <laughs> you don't have to do gray. You can do any color that you want. There, there's a wide variety of colors in this outdoor mater uh, material. And this is basically a Sunrite, or sun, sunrite, a Sunbrella knockoff material that I get off of eBay. It's very economical to use. And, and it lasts, you know, I, our boat cover I made back in 2013 or 14, 
and it's still humming right along. So it's a good product, you know, especially for something like this is not going to see constant everyday use. So I'll put the links to the material in there. So you got your machine, got your, your surface you're going to do it on, you got your material. I, I can't recommend enough, uh, like a four foot or longer metal straight edge. Um, and I even used a piece of wood that was like eight feet long when it came to doing my corners and use this conjunction with it because you're going to make some pretty long uh, marks on this project. Um, obviously, you want scissors. Um, one thing, a couple of the special tools that you're going to need. Obviously, you're going to need a hot knife. And I'll put a link to our video in which we made our own hot knife uh, and show you how to do that. But when you go cutting this nylon type material, if you cut it with a hot knife, it seals that edge. You don't have to worry about any fraying. You don't have to roll the edges under. I mean, it just, it just changes how you work with this material. Can't stress that enough. You know, for nylon material, nylon strap, anything, watch the video, make yourself a hot knife. You'll never regret it. Uh, you can buy them commercially made. Uh, they're gonna run you up over hundred bucks, I think for, for a decent hot knife. Some people use a wood iron, um, a wood burning tool or wood burning iron. I'm not sure exactly what they're called. I tried that in the beginning. I didn't like it so well because the, the distance from the handle part to the tip, you know, it didn't, I felt like I wasn't as accurate with that versus something like this with a pistol grip. Uh, but that is something that you could try as well. Um, something else that goes really well with a hot knife is a piece of glass to cut on. You can use wood, but the, the heated part, the, the actual iron part, knife edge, it's gonna get hot and burn a groove down in that wood and you might start falling the grain of the wood. Whereas a glass, it just slides right across it. The material doesn't stick to it. It just comes apart. A, a piece of tempered glass is something really nice to have. I've got a big piece I don't have here with me right now. Some people use a big tempered shelf. Um, I've heard several people have commented uh, on that and they have found a long shelf that works well for them. And, and I could see where that would be the case. Can they use plexiglass? Can't use plexiglass. Plexiglass okay. is plastic and the, the heat of the iron will melt right into that plexiglass. So, okay. so you don't want to use plexi. It needs to be real glass. And the reason I say tempered is you're going to be moving this around. You know, if you would drop it, um, the tempered glass is going to break into, you know, thousands of little bitty pieces and not cut you. Whereas plate glass is going to be big shards and, you know, it's very sharp. So it's just safer to use the tempered glass if you can find that. And like I said, those shelves work really well. Um, I'm sure, I can't think of where I've seen it at, but in stores there have been shelf units that have like glass shelves that go in, and that's probably gonna be tempered glass. One of the uh, first tools you're gonna use once you get your first seam in the, in the, the galley end wall is a snap kit. And the snaps that I used, kind of a combination here, um, the snaps I used on the door itself are these threaded stem, uh, stainless steel marine snaps and I get these from eBay or not eBay these came from Amazon and I'll put a link to those so these actually screw into the upper edge of your door and then the part that snaps to that you know is a marine kit as well and there are several different types of snap tools out there um, you know I've got one set here that I use um, this is made with a pair of vice grips it works really well for crimping on thin material now on this project and I'll show you later in the video why this is important I use this old tool and I honestly don't know where I got it from I've had it so long but this allows me to compress that snap base down around the stem so I get a good tight crimp on the stem when it comes up through so if you can find something like that that works well you actually put this down and strike with a hammer and I'll show that later in the video but you're gonna need these snaps and a snap tool and like I said, can I see the top the front yeah Honestly, I don't think that is where that came from. This just happened oh. to be a box of snaps I got in that I stored okay, it in. Mind. Yeah, so, um, and in order to put the snaps in the material, you're gonna need a hole punch. And this is a, an old set. I don't even think they have a name on them anywhere, but I've had these for gosh, probably 30 years now. And I see these in antique stores and would recommend that if you want a good hole punch, go to an antique store and get an old one. These tend to be sharper, stay sharper longer. They've got a nice brass base on them to, to, to punch them through with different size holes. Um, next pair I see, I'm gonna pick up a spare pair just to have you know on hand because the old ones work so much better than the new ones. So you've got your snaps, your snap tools, and then for the, the straps that you saw me put the stakes in that actually anchor to the end wall to the ground, you're gonna need a grommet tool in order to install those grommets in that black nylon strap. Um, and this one, I believe, came from Harbor Freight, if I remember correctly. It was either Harbor Freight or Home Depot. I'll find it and leave a link in the description as well. 
but there are two different size of grommets uh, in this kit and I used the smaller set for those quarter inch stakes to go down through it. Uh, but it has all the tools in there that you need in order to install grommets. And something I'm thinking about doing is these, um, if you've ever used a grommet tool before, you get this cutter and this is what cuts the hole in your material. And you can see that edge is chamfered and kind of sharpened. I'm going to find some way to hook this up to my soldering iron that I use for my hot knife so that I can heat that up and essentially melt my way through the material uh, and get a nice clean hole versus having to hammer on it repeatedly with a hammer. Uh, I just think that'd be a, a lot nicer setup. So I think I'm going to use a piece of copper for that and I'll probably put a video out on that when I get to that point. But I've thought about that often through the years and I'm just to the point now where I'm tired of hammering on, on these tools in order to get them to work. So there's a better way out there and I'm going to find it. Has anyone ever called you MacGyver? No, they've called me a lot of things, but I don't think I've ever been called <laughs> MacGyver. <laughs> but you'll need your snap kit. Obviously you need a pair of scissors. Um, you know, you'll need Jack the Ripper if you're like me and screw something up. Um, I used a, a UV rated heavy duty four ounce thread from Sailrite. Uh, you could probably get by, if you're using a standard home style sewing machine, um, you could get by with uh, Coates and Clark UV rated upholstery thread. I've used that a lot with my old Kenmore on, on projects, so it works well. Um, it, it's gonna be a, a probably cheaper than what that spool of uh, a UV thread from Sailrite was. Now, the one thing that I do really recommend from Sailrite on this project, and you're gonna see a little later on when we go to put the window in, is this canvas basting tape. And the, the idea behind this tape is it, it kind of acts as a temporary bond between materials. And we're going to use this when we install our window to hold our window in place and all flat so that we don't get any puckers and blisters in our windows. We go to, 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 uh, to sew it down. And I will put a link to, in the description for this basting tape, but you're going to see how slick this is later on in the video. And, and once you see it, you're definitely going to want it in order to put your windows in. Um, you know, I've even used it before with actually, you know, with some seams that I'm having a hard time holding things together while I'm trying to put it together. I can put together this basting tape, you know, leave some extra and then pull the back part and get rid of it when I'm done. So it's just like a temporary bond uh, for your materials that you're sewing together to hold everything in place. But this is a wonderful product. And as you can see, I'm about out. So I'm going to have to order some more of this and the link will be in the description. So that, you know, other than a big area to work with, um, and over by the camper, you'll see later in the video that I had a big board and some clamps I used because I can't drive stakes in concrete. So I had to find some way to hold things back off the, the camper. Uh, so there'll be some things that, that you'll find that you need in addition to that. But, but this pretty well covers it. Like I said, uh, six yards of material um, for the end wall itself. If you're gonna do the galley wing walls at the same time, really recommend you get the material at the same time off the same roll so it all matches. Um, and I believe you could probably get by with three yards or maybe even a little less um, of material if you're gonna do the wing walls. So just measure to make sure you know, that, that that suits for your application. But let's, uh, let's switch up the video now and we'll get started on showing you how I got the end wall attached to the camper and then uh, installing the window and, and all the little tricks to go with that. But it's a very simple, very doable project and we're going to walk you through it step by step here. Like I said, I'm just going to do a quick demonstration here on a cut down version with this scrap piece of material and show you how I did the, um, the top of the seam or the top of the, the end wall and get you started on the snaps and then I'll show you how I did the, the window as well. The rest of it is pretty much just straightforward sewing. You know, there's something sexy about a man in a sewing machine. <laughs> Boy, I was doing it wrong all those years in high school. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure a high schooler would have thought that was sexy. Well, there's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to flip this over and put my seam on the back side here. And I'll do the window on the front side where the markings are at. And I'm not going to get too fancy here. I merely just folded this over and brought my material that I cut with my hot knife. So I got a nice sealed edge here. Just going to fold that over to the edge of my nylon material and sew this piece of nylon in as I go. And helps not to have all those tools beside you. I'll make it work. And, and several people on the, the Facebook page commented on the sewing machine itself. And I, I got with a few of them and, and gave them my initial ideas of it. It's a fine sewing machine, um, but that said, there are things about it that I really um, weren't real fond of, and 
may never be fond of, to be honest with you. The, um, That right there is one thing that I'm not fond of. Um, it has a bad tendency of picking up the bottom and thread when you go to backstitch. And I've read everything in the book so far and I haven't figured that out, so you can see what it does. It it's just, a bird's nest. Yeah, it just makes a mess. So, and it's repeatedly done this. And I'm gonna give them a call and see if there's something that I'm either doing wrong. Um, because the other issue I had that I was really not happy about um, was the machine came out of time halfway through the second bottom. Now, fortunately, the instructions had how to, to retime the machine, but I've had my old Kenmore about 30 years now and have just beat it to death and have never adjusted the timing in it once. Um, so... And by timing, do you mean tension? No, um, the hook on the bobbin carriage itself has to be in the correct position when the needle comes down in order to hook the, the, the top thread, wrap it around and, and make your knot. If that hook gets out of position, then it won't grab that top thread. And that's what actually happened was it just stopped sewing. Just, just out of the blue, it just stopped snowing. Snowing, <laughs> it stopped sewing. I wish it would snow. Um, so like I said, in the, in the book, there were several pages of instructions on how to set that timing. So first I had to figure out that that was actually the problem was it, it was out of time. And then I had to find, there's two very small set screws, one of which was not very tight at all and was probably the, the reason that it slipped out of time. Um, but you know, I just don't think that a brand new machine like this, you should have to, to do that. Okay, take number three. <laughs> Let's see if we can get this one seam to sew. Yeah. Like I said, I have not had the best of luck with this machine. Is it sewing? Yay! Yay, it looks good. We might actually have a winner here. Don't stop. Keep working your way down, keeping that nylon pretty tight in your seam there. about these things hanging around my neck this is just a small pair of nippers on a fly line fly fishing zinger and then I just used a piece of paracord and melted the ends together with my hot knife to hang around my neck and this is super handy um, you couldn't imagine doing this without it because you I was always putting my scissors down somewhere they'd fall off lose them this is always right there around my neck I haven't stabbed myself in the gut with them yet but that's probably going to happen before this is all said and done um, but just super handy to have. Okay, so now what you can do is I'll swing around here and then plug the machine because we're electrically challenged in our shop. Plug in the hot knife. <laughs> and since I forgot my glass, we're just gonna trim off this nylon here. Squeeze the trigger, let it warm up a second. Just melt this right off. That's pretty thick nylon, so it takes a cut or two. And it just heats that up and seals that edge. You can just see how it shines right there. That's, Wait a minute, it's not, okay. That's a close up. So it just melts that edge and it will not fray once you melt that edge like that. Um, if you cut that with a pair of scissors, you know, it'll be a hairy mess in a couple of days. Let's cut her off, seal it. So now, that's essentially what I had to start with. 
it's just 60 inches wide. It's actually a little wider than that. Um, and I believe the, I have to go off memory here, but at the top was it's like 58 and a half or 55 and a half inches wide. So you got plenty of extra to work with when you go up to it. So what you want to do is find your center. That's 30 inches, I believe. Yeah, so 30 inches. So we're just going to put a mark here at 15. And now we're going to switch gears and get our hole punch. And I just kind of eyeballed center and you're just going to give a good squeeze and it will snap through all that. Is that hard to do? I mean, it takes some pretty good hand force to squeeze it, but if you find a good pair of these, like this old pair here, um, that metal is, is nice, nice metal. The new ones are kind of blunt edged and they're even harder to do yet. But if you find a good old pair in an antique mall, uh, pick them up because they're, they're worth keeping. So you get your, your hole punched in there. So then you can get your snap pieces. And they may be, let's see, here's a cap. And I'm getting feedback. From my scissors? I don't know. No, I think it's from you, your neck. Oh, probably from my whiskers. Yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. Ignore the uh, strange sounds. <laughs> okay. So how this works is you've got a snap cap with a stem that comes up through your material. So this is going to be the front side of the material. So your snap would actually come through. Huh. Didn't snap, didn't punch all the way through. I guess it's harder than what I said it was. There we go. We made that sound before. Yeah, it just snapped through the top part. Now we got a hole. All right, so your cap goes through from the top down. And this is where that old tool I was talking about comes in handy. So your cap will sit in this depressed area, kind of like a bowl right there. And then the snap part will go on like this. But you want to take as much of that um, compressor material as much as you can. So when you go to flatten that little stem, you're flattening against something that is tight. If you let it sit up here on the top and don't press that down, when you go to flatten that stem, then it's loose. And when you go to pull your material off, your snap will stay put on the snap stem that's on your door. So there's kind of a trick to that. And that's where that tool that I had right here. That's what I like about it because this slides down and you can hold pressure down on your cap or on your snap like that. So when you go to strike it with your hammer, you're holding this down and compressing that material. And it just makes a better connection when you're dealing with thick material like that. They probably make a better tool for that. And I don't have one, but um, I, I've tried using my vice grips over and over again on thick material like this. And every time it does the same thing, I just don't get a good, good snap. And if you're wondering why my fingers are so dirty, I was working on another camper project today and I got black paint all over my hands and I tried to get it off as much as I could. You might want to move the camera back so I don't smack the... So just strike that a couple times. I may have to do this on a solid surface because my tape is probably bouncing and absorbing some of that. So, mm -hmm. okay. So what I did was I dropped down to the concrete floor and used it, holy smokes, that's really close. Um, used it to, um, to have a solid surface to back that up with and got a good crimp on that stem. And that way it's nice and tight. So then, like I said, this was a 60 inch wide piece of material. I took it over to the camper. So let's shut off and go over to the camper. So here at the camper, what I did was I marked from each side, found the center point of the camper and installed the snap base into the underside of the door edge. And so I just had this one snap to start with. So I took my material that was snapped there in the center. And then what I did was just, I had my, my snap bases on here where I had them positioned at. And I just would mark that. You can feel the depression of the center of your snap. Just mark that for each snap and install your snaps like you did your first one here. And that's got your 60 inch piece of material attached to your camper door at that point when you get to there. And then I just stretched it out down to the floor and I had a heavy board here that I used clamps to attach my material to so I could get the angle of the material from the door. And that's what I worked off of to get the sides and the, and the top 
to line up. What you'll do when you have your material hanging over the edge here is I allowed for a half inch hem allowance. So that I had about a half inch for sticking past this edge to attach my side to. So I got that measurement uh, for both sides, made a mark and then measured what the overall width is. And then struck a long line down that material and took my hot knife and, and cut down that edge and sealed that edge. And that allowed enough material to attach my side to. So you added an inch to each side? Half inch. Just, oh, so t inch total. Yeah, an inch total. You can add whatever you want. I went with a half inch for that setup. Um, you know, if you wanted to do an inch and do a double stitch, you know, you could. That'd just be hanging down that much more on the inside of your, mm. of your uh, end wall when you do it. So, like I said, marked my half inch is what I used and then struck a line, used the hot knife, trimmed that edge off. And then once I got it back together and got it up here and got it all snapped in, I measured down from this corner to the ground in here and then measured back to make sure that I had 60 inches or less because I had 60 inches of material to work with. And it just worked out perfectly that I did. So what I did was I took this measurement and probably added a couple inches to it and went and cut um, a rectangle of that height and then that 60 inch width and then struck a line from corner to corner in my rectangle. So I cut that diagonal line. So essentially I had two long triangle pieces of material and that became my sidewalls. So down this edge here, I rolled a half inch hem and sewed that. And again, everything gets cut with a hot knife so you don't have to worry about fraying. So I rolled that edge, sewed this hem down this front edge and then attached to that half inch extra material here I folded that over and sewed my side to that. So that was pretty simple. I got my two sides on now. And then it was just a matter of, of finding where I wanted to put that two inch hem at the bottom at and getting that sewed on. So really it's pretty easy. It's just big and it's bulky. That's where the, the big issue comes in. And you need a few tools like the snap tool to put it in. Let's go back to the table and I'll show you how I did my window. So here on the window, um, and, and like I said earlier, I'm probably not doing this the correct way but I've been doing it this way for a long time and I've had pretty good success with it. So I'm just going to show you how I do it. And if you want to do it a different way, you're more than welcome to do it that way. Um, what I've got here laid out, and I used marker just for layout purposes for the video, uh, because the pencil line that I use, you know, just didn't show up real well for the camera. So I heavied it up with a, a marker so that you can see it. So I've got a 10 inch wide window by a six inch tall wide window. And then I've got this little half inch wing on the top up here on each corner. So this is the top of the material or the top of your wing wall and this is where it's attached to your door. Now the reason for this little, little wing right here is we're going to cut this top and continue past to that end point right there. And then we're going to notch this material so that it slips up underneath it. And the reason I do this is so that the top of the window overlaps the window. And then the sides will be sewn on the, the front edge, on the, the two sides and the bottom. And that overlap allows for the water that lands up here to, to transfer onto the, the window material and just slide right over. If you just sewed this on top of your material all the way around, this would just be like a big you know, catch-all right here for all your water and then it would be running down inside your, your, um, your room. So let me cut this out real quick with the hot knife and then we'll trim these little corners off of this glass and I'll show you how. The material for the vinyl, you wanna make this wider than your window opening to do it the way that I do it. And the reason for that is we're gonna take this canvas basting tape and attach the window on the front and then up the top on the back to the material. And the reason for doing that is it's real easy when you go, especially the size window that I put in our uh, end wall, when you get that big, it's really easy to get a pucker in your material as you go sewing along. But if you use this basting tape and get everything laid down flat before you start, then you can sew right along your edge with, you know, I don't think we got any puckers in, in the window mm -hmm. I put in the yeah, other end wall. Smooth. Yeah, so this is a really nice product. And again, I get this from Sailrite. So let me uh, turn the camera off here. I'll cut this out real quick with a hot knife and we'll get back with you. Okay, we've got our window cut out now with our hot knife. And you can see the little extensions that I made here. And then the little cuts passed. And then I trimmed the window so that I've got one inch at the top to work with. And this will go up underneath the top of the material. And this just slides up under the material like this. And you just bring it up 
tight till it's touching right there. And now what I'll do is I'll put the basting tape here outside of, and I typically put a few little pencil marks here and you won't see these when we're done. <clears throat> and this gives me an idea of where the outside of the material is at. And then flip this over and do the same thing on the back. And like I said, I've done this a lot of, a lot of windows and I've done them all about the same way and I've had really good luck with, with no leaks. Okay, so that gives me an idea of where to put my basting tape at. And you want to put it close to the edge of the material because what you're going to do is if this lines up here, your basting tape is out here, you're going to put your seam a quarter inch off this edge and then once you get it all sewn in place, we're going to lift this up and slide a piece of real thin metal underneath there and use a sharp knife to come down through here and strike a line and trim off this outside edge. So you get a nice crisp line down the side of your window and then you wind up with this sealed edge all the way around. I'll probably run out of this, so I may just do a side or two to show you how this works. So we're just going to go down through here. Turn that off. And I'm putting this to that real faint pencil mark that I put so I knew where I was to go with my tape so I'd have room for my seam. And this isn't super tacky, but it's tacky enough that it will hold your vinyl window material in place so that you can sew and not have to worry about getting all those crazy puckers in your, your vinyl material. Like I said, I'm kind of self-taught when it comes to all this, so I'm sure there's probably a better way out there. And if you know what it is, please feel free to share it with the, everybody. So now we're just peel our backing up. Tape stays down. And you just want to make sure that you're all the way up in that corner right there when you go to put this down. And just smooth it out. Let's get a good corner there. And like I said, my hands aren't normally this dirty, but that paint, I used everything I had in the garage trying to get it off, and it's going to have to wear off. It's amazing how paint sticks so much better to your skin than it does to any surfaces you're trying to put it on. Lost patience. There we go with that. Make sure you're up in that corner all the way there. This was probably the most tedious part of ours. <clears throat> the sewing the hem was the hardest part just because everything was already together. But I was really conscious about trying to get this all the way flat on that big window. I think it was 16 by 30. So it was about the size of this paper. Well, in fact, that's probably what it came from. This is probably the, the window scrap that I had left over when I cut it out. It just dawned on me why I had that. I'm gonna lift this up and trim this tape off so that it's not sticking past my window edge because it will stick to the, the top of my table if I don't. And I remember when I did the, the windows in the sewing or in the sailboat tent cover, the old Kenmore machine that I was using, the it didn't allow this vinyl to slide across the table. And oh my gosh, I was about to pull my hair out trying to figure out how to get that stuff to slide over. There was something about the table, it just, it just really stuck to it. So what I wound up doing was covering the table with painter's tape. And um, it worked really slick after that. But you can use tissue paper too. Didn't have that. 
Got to remember, it's a man sewing. <clears throat> So there we go. So now everything is taped down. You got a nice crisp window with no, no puckers in your edge. And when you sew this down, everything will stay put and you won't get those puckers in the end between your material and your vinyl window. So let me go around this real quick and sew a, sew a seam. And we're back here, we got everything held down with the basting tape and we're just gonna sew a seam around this. And I'm gonna go like a quarter inch off of the edge of the opening with my seam. That's the plan anyway, we'll see how this goes. And I'm having a struggle with my pedal because the bottom is slick and this concrete, it just, I keep chasing my pedal across the floor. Just remember to bury your needle before you go making your turn. So. Well, that basting tape makes it so nice because you aren't chasing everything around when you're sewing this. Everything just stays put. <laughs> this walking foot machine it physically moves so much that the whole table is, is kind of shaking as we're going here. In. Okay. So there we've got our windows sewn in. And what I use typically is a piece of coil stock. And that's just a thin piece of aluminum trim. So I'm gonna peel this up and lift it up like this. And I'm gonna slip this piece of coil stock underneath that window material. And if I had my shears with me, I'd shorten that up, but I don't have them with me. So take it right up to where you want it at. So I take it and put it all the way to my material, to my stitch like that. And then I can just put the material, put that tape right back down and it'll stay place. Take my metal straight edge and put where I want the straight edge or where I want my cut to be. And that metal underneath there will prevent me from cutting through to my material. I learned that the hard way. <laughs> so you just take a nice sharp knife, just keep it right up against your straight edge. And on that long window that I did, which is what this piece of material came from, I actually clamped this straight edge down. So it makes sure that it didn't slip on me while I was doing this. If it can happen, it will happen. So just peel that off, get that underneath there. Look at that nice straight edge that you got right there on your window. It's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. So you do the same thing for your other two sides, flip it over, do the same thing for your, your top and your window's done. That basting tape though, and like I said, I'll put the link in the description for that from Sailrite. That's the ticket for holding all this down and keeping your material nice and taut so that you don't get those puckers. So that is pretty much it. The, uh, let me get rid of this for a second. You know what I've noticed? 
man sewing is a lot louder than woman sewing. It's because we get her done. <laughs> <laughs> it's because you're loud. Yeah, well, that too. So the only other thing, you know, after, let's see, when did I put the window in? I'm trying to think. I guess I put the window in before I put the sides on the, the end wall. Uh, that was probably the easiest time to do it. I definitely wouldn't want to do it after I get it all together because, like I said, it was just throwing that seam around the bottom with everything together was just a struggle trying to keep everything on the table. Um, you know, and the bigger the table that you can come up with, the better off you're going to be on a big project like this. That, that's probably the best, strongest tip I can give you is find a really big table or multiple folding tables and put them together so that you can keep everything up on the same plane. Um, but from this point, you know, like I said, if you get your side sewn on, you do that hem at the bottom. Um, I put four straps, like six inches long, uh, with like four inches hanging off of the edge of the, the, of the uh, room. And you probably saw that earlier in the video. And then I put my grommets in the bottom of that. And I may go add a few more grommets up closer to the material. So the different elevations that we're on, it gives me a different place to, to fasten those down. But um, that, that's pretty much it. it. It's a pretty simple project. Um, it's just big and you know, just take your time work through it, you know, the snap material, you know, pick up those on Amazon. I'll put the links for, for those snaps in there, um, you know, and just play with the, the placement of the snaps in your door as far as where they put the, the fasteners at and, and get as close as you can. And, you know, I think, um, I think the average individual should be able to do this without any problem. What do you think? Well. I mean, you keep saying how easy it is, and compared to some things you've done, it probably is, but I think it's kind of intimidating. You're defeating my video. My whole thing was, the whole Sorry. purpose was to instill confidence in people so they can do this to themselves. Well, <laughs> so don't listen to Cindy, just listen to me. <laughs> yeah, don't listen to me. I don't know what I'm uh, talking about. It, it's pretty straightforward, and like I said, the email is there in the... Uh, in the description so if you have any questions just reach out to us we'll be we'll be glad to help you however we can so you know, i hope this helps someone you know if nothing else do the exact opposite of what i did and you might have pretty good luck um, but you know it, it's pretty simple so hope everyone enjoyed this learned something from it and uh, you know it, if i'd inspire someone to, to give it a try that's that's a winner so the uh, you know, a bug biting me in the back of my neck already. It's too early for bugs. It is. Nope, it's a ladybug. Oh. So there we go. They are around. <laughs> yeah. So thanks everybody for watching, and uh, you know, hope you stick around and uh, watch our next videos that come out, and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye.